This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the best way to make an amazing website. Apple just announced the new Apple Silicon Macs with the new M1 chip, and today I'll let you know everything that video editors need to know, both the shockingly positive parts and also a few downsides that you absolutely need to know before investing in one of these new MacBook Airs, Mac Minis, or MacBook Pros. Now I actually have four new Apple Silicon Macs ordered, so if you wanna see real world performance in Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro, and DaVinci Resolve 17, and how they compare to Intel Macs, make sure you guys subscribe and enable notifications so you guys don't miss out on those videos. Starting off, I have to quickly cover what this even is and why Apple is making this change. In 2005, Apple moved from using PowerPC processors to Intel because they had better performance and used a lot less power, meaning your battery life was a lot better and there was less heat and fan noise. Intel was way better, but as you may know, in the recent years, MacBook Pros have struggled with getting way too hot, and because of that, they are loud and they lose potential performance. In many cases, this makes eight core models barely faster than six core and 10 core iMacs perform the same as the new eight core ones. And that's because Intel is now four years behind where they said they would be in terms of performance per watt. After waiting year after year for Intel, Apple has finally had it, and they're moving to their own ARM processors, which are similar to the ones in iPhones and iPads, which are shocking in terms of performance for how little power they use. In some cases, these processors and graphics have better performance than Intel Macs, and if you guys have seen me try to edit Canon R5 footage on my Mac Pro, and it's choppy, and then go to an iPad Pro and it's smooth, wow, that's just incredible. Now there's already a few Windows computers that are using Android phone processors, but they perform horribly, mainly because of software optimization. And this is what Apple is really good at. But there are still gonna be some issues for video editors. More on this in the downside section. Now before I cover that, the performance differences and shocking editing improvements, let me give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. If you've been thinking about making your own website, Squarespace is seriously the best way to go. We've built multiple websites and you can too with literally no web making experience. You just choose a template and easily customize blocks of text and images. It's incredibly simple, it's affordable, and our sites have been running flawlessly for years, bringing in new clients thanks to its built-in SEO tools. So whether you're making a website for a small business or for literally anything else, go to squarespace.com slash for a free, no credit card required trial, or use the link down below, and when you're ready to launch, you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Now let's talk about performance, and let's start out with just the M1 chip in general before talking about the differences between the three new Apple Silicon Macs. The five nanometer N1 chip has 16 billion transistors, so 60% more than the very best iPad Pro, which is already faster than many MacBooks. It's an eight core processor, which is crazy, since the previous 13 inch MacBooks had either dual or quad core chips at the base. Now, what really impressed me is the battery life when rendering video. Apple said it is twice as good, which is really nice because that's when my MacBook would really drain like crazy. And this is gonna help anybody that is traveling without access to wall power. And because the M1 chip has a bunch of dedicated video encoding and decoding hardware chips, it won't need to use the full CPU power to do this. Meaning in many cases, it will be sipping power while editing 4K video. To really show this off, Apple says the M1 is twice as powerful as the CPU in the MacBook Air, but for processing video, they list it as being four times as powerful, which means they are definitely making use of those special chips. What's even more impressive is that they are comparing the new M1 MacBook Air to the very best i7 MacBook Air with the very best G7 graphics. Now, when I first saw these numbers, I was expecting them to be comparing against the base model with the slow G5 graphics, but no, they are not. So the performance difference is even greater comparing just the same price points. What I'm most curious about is what hardware decoders are in this chip. If you didn't know already, the brand new NVIDIA Amphir graphics cards and the not yet released AMD RDNA 2 graphics cards, they don't have support for 10-bit 422 Canon footage from the R5, the R6, and other cameras like the C70. Because of this, even my $15,000 Mac Pro can't play back this footage smoothly without first transcoding it, but a $1,000 MacBook Air might be able to do it perfectly smooth. I'll be finding out early next week, so make sure you guys are subscribed if you wanna find out. 
Now, speaking about graphics cards, of course, these are not as powerful as the huge desktop cards that use 30 times more power, more on this in just a bit, but they are absolute beasts compared to other small laptops. The very best G7 graphics chip in the $1,800 base spec 13-inch MacBook Pro has one teraflop of graphics performance, which is the full raw power of the graphics card. The new base 13-inch MacBook Pro has 2.6 teraflops, so more than two and a half times better performance while using less power, and of course, if you have older MacBooks, it's an even bigger difference. If you're somebody editing with a 13-inch MacBook Pro, you'll know that you can edit 4K video fairly well, but as soon as you start color grading and say adding LUTs, adding transitions and other things, it just starts to slow down like crazy while at the same time getting loud. This is where the Apple MacBooks will really stand out. It's because of this that I have always lugged around a 15 or a 16 inch MacBook Pro when I really would have preferred a 13 inch. And with these new ones, some people will finally be able to go for a smaller, cheaper Mac and have better performance and way better battery life. Another change is machine learning, and it is 15 times faster now thanks to dedicated processing cores for this specifically. And for video editors, this means that we're gonna be seeing way more AI-based tools like auto framing, masking, and smart color grading without needing to spend a ton of time tracking and selecting different parts of the image. Now, Apple didn't give us too much info on regular video editing, but here is everything that they did say and the full info behind the claims. First, the MacBook Air can play back multiple streams of 4K ProRes. Now, looking deeper, they use two streams of 4K 24fps ProRes 4444, and they played back for five minutes straight without any draw frames. Now, my question is if regular 422 is harder or easier than what they used, since it's a very interesting choice for a MacBook Air. If I had to bet, I would say that 422 is a little bit more tough because it's more compressed and they wanted to get the best result on the MacBook Air. The next spec for the MacBook Air is rendering titles over five times faster than the previous i7 best MacBook Air. And this is very impressive and it's a huge improvement because the 13-inch MacBook Airs just really struggled when you're rendering things. If we look at gaming or photo editing, it's about three times faster, so you can see how well optimized these M1 chips are for video editing. Now, personally, if you're a video editor, I wouldn't buy the MacBook Air because it is fanless and the base $999 model has less graphics performance than the 1250 model, and at that point, you're really close to the MacBook Pro, which has a lot of extra benefits. Now being fanless means that for regular video editing, it will do well, but if you're doing very long projects or you're transcoding or rendering, it is gonna slow down after some time, whereas the 13-inch MacBook Pro won't, and the 13-inch MacBook Pro has even better performance since Apple can push more wattage to it. On top of that, the 13-inch MacBook Pro has better battery life, it has a brighter display, it has better speakers and microphones, better performance, and even more than that. Apple said that it has 2.6 times better CPU performance, which was already really good with the previous quad core, and five times better graphics compared to that 1.7 gigahertz i7 with the Intel 645, and that is based on rendering ProRes files. Now I'm used to Apple showing, we'll say 1.4 times better, or maybe in some cases two times better performance, but not five times better video performance. So that's very impressive. Now Apple also said that they could play back 8K ProRes in DaVinci Resolve at full 8K resolution without dropping frames. Now that is something that only the $4,000 high-end 16-inch MacBook Pro can do. And this is a cheap, ultra-portable laptop. Now, as you may know, more and more video editing is moving to graphics, even raw video editing, which Apple did mention multiple times. They said that you can edit and color grade 6K raw in real time in DaVinci Resolve. Now, I am guessing that is Blackmagic Raw, but that is really awesome for a 13-inch MacBook Pro. And then if you guys know, that's the same as editing 4K 60 FPS Blackmagic Raw comparing 6K 24, so very impressive. Now in Final Cut, they're saying we get six times faster 
title rendering, which also accounts for other effects that are using metal to render. So that is very impressive. And if you're transcoding ProRes, it is 2.8 times faster. Now, my real question is how will it compare to my 16 inch MacBook Pro? Now, I know a part of that is just raw power, but another part is having special hardware chips and software optimization. So I'm really excited to compare it. And now let's talk about the new Mac Mini. For $699, you have the same performance as the $1,300 MacBook Pro, and it not only blows away the previous $800 Mac Mini with the i3 processor, but even the six core i7, especially for video editing. Now the performance differences are even more impressive here, but they are mostly comparing it to that i3 base CPU with weaker graphics. So in general, the video editing performance is the same as the 13 inch MacBook Pro. Personally, I am really excited for this Mac mini because it will allow a ton of people to get very good video editing performance at a very low cost. And because of optimizations, if you're using Final Cut or DaVinci Resolve, this $700 Mac will smoke $700 custom built PCs for video editing. If you guys wanna see a showdown between a custom PC, let me know down in the comment section. Now, before we touch on the downsides, let me cover a few things that all three of these new Macs share. One is support for up to a 6K Pro Display XDR using Thunderbolt USB 4 ports and support for PCI Express Gen 4, which is a first for a Mac. This means that if an Apple Silicon Mac Pro comes out, it will have support for the latest SSDs and possibly support for the latest graphics cards at full speeds. We also have support for Wi-Fi 6 for the first time in a Mac, which means that I will finally get the full speed that I'm paying for as far as my internet over Wi-Fi. And now let's get into the downsides. I'm gonna start with one that could be huge for some video editors, and that is the fact that the new Apple Silicon Macs no longer support external graphics cards. Now, for a lot of people, this won't matter since they will no longer need it, but if you have one or two eGPUs connected to chug through metal accelerated effects like transcoding while denoising or other things where an eGPU really helps, you're gonna be out of luck. Now, Apple is still selling the Intel 6 core Mac mini, which costs more money and it's slower and it's louder, but other than eGPU support, there are still a few reasons you might wanna buy one. First off, these first Apple Silicon Macs only come with two USB-C, Thunderbolt, and USB-4 ports. Now the base 13-inch MacBooks have always had only two, but the Mac Mini had four ports. Now this means that you can only have one 5 or 6K display connected instead of two, but my real question is if the total bandwidth is split between these two ports. I'm guessing that it is. That means that if you connect a 5K or a 6K display, and you connect, say, an ultra-fast SSD or a 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter, then you might not get the full performance where you could with the older Macs. I'm gonna test that as soon as I get it in. Now, you may have heard me mention the 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter, and that is because you can no longer get the 10 gigabit Ethernet option with the new M1 Mac minis like you can with the Intel ones. Now, this really sucks if you wanna to connect to a server like I do, and you're gonna to need to use an adapter, which takes up one of those two slots, and it could potentially run slower if you're maxing out the other one. Thankfully, my QNAP allows for Thunderbolt connectivity, but that still uses up one of those ports, leaving me with just one, where in the past, I could use 10 gigabit ethernet and have all four ports remaining. Now there's another downside with the mini. We can no longer upgrade RAM ourselves, which could save you money, and we now can only have a maximum of 16 gigabytes instead of a max of 64. Now this could potentially not be as big of a deal as some people think if the software is well optimized. The iPad Pro only has four or six gigs of RAM and it edits video and photos very well. So I'll be testing out how 16 gigabytes compares to having 64 gigabytes with the older Mac mini. Now with that, the new Mac mini is cheaper. So even after upgrading the RAM from Apple for 200 bucks, it's still cheaper than buying a six core and upgrading your own RAM. Talking about software, there could still be some issues, even though for the most part, Apple has done a super good job. Now Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve will have native support for these processors, but I haven't heard anything for Premiere Pro. And knowing Adobe, they are usually quite slow. Software that's not optimized will still work, but it won't work as fast. So I'm excited to see the differences between these editing programs with this new hardware, and if Premiere will be slower or faster than the older Macs until it's optimized. 
So with all of that said, I'm excited to have incredible video editing performance in a super light MacBook Pro that can even potentially outperform a high-end 16-inch MacBook Pro, iMacs, and even the Mac Pro in certain cases. You guys know that I'll be putting them through their paces and comparing them, so make sure you guys are subscribed and you guys have those notifications enabled. Now, if you need a new website, one that is nice and it just works and works well, check out Squarespace. You can get that two week, no credit card required trial. So go and use that link down below. This has been Max and I will see you guys in the next video.